to the moon! Chapter 1. Sputnik kickstarts the space race. 1955, America and Russia are eight years into an argument over whose idea is best, capitalism or communism, a spat that will go on to span another five decades to become the infamous period of history now known as the Cold War. It was a war of words, one based almost entirely on convincing your enemy you could wipe them out in the flash of a nuke should they dare attack you. 1955 holds particular significance as it is the year the space race started and when tensions between the capitalist and communist superpowers truly skyrocketed. So first and foremost, why did the space race start? After several years of squabbling, both the USA and USSR had a nice stockpile of nuclear weapons that could be used to blow each other up, and boy did they threaten to do so. However, unlike the first nuclear bombs, these nukes simply couldn't be loaded up onto a plane and dropped, as both sides were so riled up that they would shoot anything out of their airspace that looked vaguely like an enemy aircraft. One way around this problem was to slap a nuclear bomb on a rocket and fire it in the direction of your enemy. Thanks to World War II, weaponized rockets were all the rage, but these had a tiny range at best and were no way near powerful enough to carry a heavy nuclear warhead. So both sides started to develop bigger and better rockets, ones that were capable of hitting a target on the other side of the world. Now it's all well and good simply saying you have a nuclear tip missile that can reach your enemy, but how do you actually prove you can strike them without actually striking them? Why, you use your intercontinental ballistic missile to put something detectable into space. The logic being, if your rockets can reach the lofty heights of outer space, they can also reach your enemy's capitals. And so the race begins. On the 29th of July 1955, James C. Haggerty, press secretary to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, announced that the US intended to launch small, Earth-circling satellites sometime in 1957 or 1958. Not a week had passed, and Soviet physicist Leonid Sedov announced, eh, yes, the Soviet Union will also do this. Now, Eisenhower was never keen on the space race. He feared that a satellite even 100 kilometers over Russian soil would be seen as violating their airspace. He didn't want to be seen as a warmonger to the American people or to the red state propaganda writers. So instead of asking the US Army with their very military looking rockets to help launch the first US satellite, Eisenhower turns to the Naval Research Lab instead. The Navy were designing Vanguard, a very unwarlike rocket that was intended to deliver scientific equipment into the upper atmosphere, not splody bombs onto enemies. It was just what Eisenhower was looking for, and it's quite likely this decision allowed the Russians to become the first to put a satellite in space. While the US were racing towards fulfilling their satellite ambitions, albeit gingerly, the Soviet Union was storming ahead. Meet Sergei Korolev, chief designer of the Soviet space program, and the man who convinced the Soviet Academy of Sciences to create a commission whose sole purpose was to beat the Americans into space. Once the Americans had announced their intentions, Korolev started to work on the design of the first Soviet satellite, as well as the rocket that could actually get it into space. By 1957, Korolev had developed the world's first ICBM, an R-7 rocket which delivered a Mach 5-ton warhead from the launch pad in Chiratam, now known as the Baikonur Cosmodrome, all the way to Kamchatka, a Russian peninsula over 6,400 kilometers away. With an upper weight of about 5,000 kilograms to play with, Korolev started to design his satellite. It was codenamed Object D, as D was the fifth letter of the Russian alphabet, where the first four letters, A, B, B, and G, were assigned to existing objects of the nuclear payload variety. It's fair to say Korolev had high hopes for Object D. Weighing an impressive 1,400 kilograms, that's 3,000 pounds, the all-new Object D will dwarf any American pig dog attempt at a satellite. Featuring the latest in cone-based design work, Object D will let you measure the planet's magnetic field, conduct numerous readings of radiation levels, and take photos of the Earth from space. Order yours now! However, Object D proved to be more trouble than it was worth, with many an issue arising from trying to get the measurement devices to actually work. As time was ticking, work on Object D was put on ice for a few years and a new, much simpler project was proposed. Object PS, where the PS stood for Prostaishi Sputnik, which translates to Simple Satellite. Soon dubbed PS1, the new satellite was designed and built in less than a month. At just under 60 centimeters across, PS1 was no bigger than a beach ball. The four protruding antennas were powered by simple batteries, so PS1 could transmit a series of beeps on two shortwave radio frequencies. This was so anyone on Earth, including Americans, could tune in and listen to the Soviet satellite broadcasting beeps right above their rotten capitalist heads. And of course, it was given a good polish to make PS1 highly reflective so it would be easier to spot when it was in orbit. 
By the 20th of September, Korolev now had a functioning satellite, as well as a rocket that could get it into space, so he and the State Commission set a date for launch, the 6th of October, 1957. After 10 days, Korolev's R-7 rocket, along with his simple satellite, now named Sputnik 1, were undergoing the final checks before their launch date. But then something caught Korolev's eye. While he was scanning the upcoming scientific talks and conferences, he noticed the Americans were delivering a presentation called Satellite Over the Planet, on the 6th of October, the same day he was going to launch his satellite. He assumed the Yanks were going to launch their satellite a few days prior to their talk, and he was not going to be beaten by a few measly days. Korolev pushed forward the launch date to the 4th of October, and with everything in place, Sputnik 1 was launched at 10.28pm from the Soviet missile base in Turatan. It was a miracle that Sputnik was placed into orbit, as almost everything went wrong with the R-7 rocket. Many of its engines ignited too late, the fuel flow system failed, and the main engine was shut down a second too soon. All errors combined meant Sputnik was placed in a lower orbit than was initially planned, but nonetheless, Sputnik had made it to orbit. Now that Sputnik was up there, Korolev needed proof it was actually working. They didn't have to wait long before a telegram arrived from the tracking station over 6,000 kilometers away in Kamchatka. The now infamous beep 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 of Sputnik had been received. There was much rejoicing at Jiratan, but Korolev told them to hold off just for a bit. He needed to see if Sputnik could actually complete an orbit. And sure enough, over an hour and a half later, the personnel at the launch site heard Sputnik's trademark beeps. And there was much rejoicing. Korolev immediately called the Soviet leader of the USSR, Nikita Khrushchev, with a simple message. The Soviet Union has put the world's first artificial satellite into space around the Earth. At the time, Khrushchev didn't quite grasp the sheer magnitude of this scientific accomplishment, and essentially said, eh, that's nice dear, I'm going back to bed now, bye. It was only when news of Sputnik reached American ears that Khrushchev realized the true impact of Sputnik and the awesome feat the USSR had just achieved. On the next, to the moon. America reacts to the launch of Sputnik and finally gets started on their space program. 